I'm Darius Spearman, and you're watching African Elements. In this episode, Danger and Opportunity, African Americans on the Spanish Frontier. Thank you for watching African Elements, where we create Black and Africana Studies content for the classroom and for the people. In this episode, we're going to be looking at the dynamics of life for Blacks on the Spanish frontier in the Americas. How does the frontier translate to both danger and opportunity for persons of African descent in the Spanish and English American colonies? What role did Africans play in shaping what was to become the American frontier? To understand why we find Blacks in the Spanish frontier regions, let's briefly review the background of Spanish expansion into the Western Hemisphere. As we saw previously, Islam began to expand across North Africa around the 6th century. The year 711 initiated 700 years of North African Islamic rule in Spain until the reconquest in 1492. As a result, Spain was of exceedingly mixed ancestry. Not only had the Spaniards been intermarrying with a foreign population for over 700 years, but during that time of Muslim expansion and conquest, the critical Trans-Saharan trade route had come under Islamic control. You may recall Emperor Mansa Musa's famous pilgrimage as the West African Empire of Mali staked its position as a prominent player on the critical Trans-Saharan trade route. Since slavery is often a byproduct of expansion and conquest, West African slaves had become a product of Trans-Saharan trade, and through these trade routes, they made their way into Spain in significant numbers by 1492. In 1492, two things happen that are significant to our story. We know the first one, Columbus sails across the Atlantic. The second significant thing that happens in 1492 is that Spain's reconquest was complete, ending 700 years of North African rule. When that happened, Spain undertook a vigorous attempt to try to stamp out 700 years of Muslim influence by expelling those it considered to be non-Spaniard. As Spain rebranded itself as a Catholic nation, not only were the Muslims expelled in this pre-Inquisition climate, but the Jews were also expelled. In an odd way, Spain's undesirables were able to gain entry and an opportunity to share in the spoils of colonization by purchasing a document effectively changing their religion to Catholic. In doing so, they were able to take part in the Spanish conquest of the Americas, where their ascension up the social ranks came at the expense of the indigenous population. If you recall, this isn't so different from how the Islamic expansion took place, as conquered people joined the military and then set about conquering their neighbors. So with high risk on the frontier came high reward. We know that large numbers of Africans were present in New Spain. Spain's American colonies, because the Spanish were meticulous census takers. Ultimately, in New Spain, those criollos, those second generation colonists who were born in the Americas, sought to associate themselves with the Peninsulares, those pure Spaniards of high status who remained comfortable on the Iberian Peninsula. As a result, a peculiar racial caste system developed in the Americas. What you see here is a simplified version of that system with pure Espanol on top, African and Native American on the bottom, and various racial mixtures in between. We know from the census, for example, that when Spain and later Mexico had possession of California, the San Francisco garrison was about 28% black. But we have to add an asterisk to that. In New Spain, people of mixed race could make their way up the racial caste system through military conquest of the Aztecs, Mayans, or any number of various people, and in the process, they can gain land, wealth, and status. Oddly, just as one could gain Catholic status by purchasing a document and escaping persecution in Spain, one could gain Espanol status simply by purchasing a document and, in effect, changing their race. So, notice here Maria Rufina Navarro, who's listed as a mulatto in 1781, but as a mestizo in 1790. Look at Jose Navarro here, who's listed in 1781 as a mestizo and in 1790s in Espanol. So the asterisk here is that when we look at the Spanish census in San Francisco, for example, and notice that it was about 28% black, you have to add the phrase at least to that figure. We know all the people in the census who are listed in the census as mulatto are in fact mulatto, but those who are listed as Espanol may have once been mulatto. 
In fact, the further along the Spanish frontier you go, the more of these purity of blood certificates one tends to find. But oddly, these documents stating that they're of pure Spanish blood are actually evidence to the contrary, since those purchasing them are doing so specifically for the purpose of changing their status. Manpower was a chief concern throughout Spain's expansion in the Americas. Much of the colonial structure was based on the need to populate newly conquered territories and make loyal Spanish citizens out of the persons of those regions. That's what the mission system was all about. Spain was willing to take people from wherever they can find them. As it turns out, those with the most to gain by going to the Spanish frontier happened to be people of color in general, and black folks in particular. That's why it shouldn't be surprising that we find large numbers of Spanish-speaking black folks in the frontier regions. In fact, as we move along the Spanish frontier westward, the complexion of the frontier becomes progressively darker. That's the reason why we shouldn't be surprised to find that the last Mexican governor of California was an Afro-Latino by the name of Pio Pico. Additionally, we find people such as Estebanico in the early expeditions of the Spanish frontier in Florida. That need for manpower became clear early in the Spanish settlement of Florida. The Spanish governor of Florida, Governor Zuniga, clearly understood that these undesirables were necessary in populating the Spanish frontier, and he heavily utilized those he described as Negroes, Mulattoes, Indians, and Mestizos, and other dastardly persons to populate newly acquired regions under the guiding principle of repoblacion, that is, to govern is to populate. To meet that need, the Spanish governor in 1738 founded the town of Pueblo de Gracia Real de Santa Teresa de Mose, or Mose for short. In doing so, he gave free land to Spanish-speaking inhabitants on the frontier while fortifying the border between New Spain and its colonial British rival. The town of Mose is critically important in understanding the relationship between the British colonies and later the United States and the Spanish colonies that later became Mexico. The Spanish governor of Florida understood that Spanish-speaking blacks weren't the only ones interested in getting free land at Mose. Mose was very strategically juxtaposed, practically on the border between the British and Spanish territories, in a way that was clearly intended to be enticing for black slaves in the British colonies. Journals, newspapers, and advertisements signaled constant concern over runaways in South Carolina. In January 1738, South Carolina Lieutenant Governor William Bull brought those concerns to the governing body where he lamented the encouragement lately given by the Spaniards for desertion from Negroes from this government to the garrison of St. Augustine. The desertion of our slaves is a matter of so much importance to this province that I doubt not but that you will readily concur in my opinion with me that the most effectual means ought to be used to discourage and prevent it in the future. In the year following the establishment of Mose, the largest and most expensive slave revolt in the history of the British colonies, the Stono Rebellion, commenced in South Carolina on September 9, 1739. Led by a slave named Jemmy, the rebels recruited nearly 60 other slaves, killed 22 to 25 whites, and made their way toward the Spanish frontier in Florida before being intercepted by the South Carolina militia. Because of the nature of the frontier as a meeting point between two or more groups, that point tends to be unstable and constantly shifting, ebbing and flowing as the various groups interact with one another. As a result, frontiers tend to be loosely structured regions where the social rules aren't yet firmly established. With its relative lack of social structure, the frontier could be a dangerous and lawless place. In San Francisco in the early 1850s, there were five murders every six days. But for that same reason, black folks on the frontier experienced a region filled with opportunities and relatively few social restrictions, as long as they weren't one of the five people murdered every six days. One of those frontier characters, James Beckworth, led a very tough and rugged life on the frontier. Nevertheless, he also enjoyed a degree of social freedom in California that he would never have experienced had he remained in Virginia where he was born. As a mountain man, he lived a dangerous life as a trapper for the Rocky Mountain Fur Company, and later as one of the persons who surveyed a safe passage through the Sierra Nevada mountains after the Donner Party fiasco, a passage that still bears his name, Beckworth Pass. What about women on the frontier? 
If the rules regarding race on the frontier aren't as firmly entrenched, would you expect to find women on the frontier confined to the home and domestic roles? Well, what we find is that just as the social rules regarding race are relatively relaxed, so are the social rules regarding gender. That's the reason why we find some gun-toting women out west. Because of the relatively loose social structure on the frontier, you find women in roles that one simply couldn't imagine seeing them in if they were in places like Boston or New York during the same period. As with Beckworth, the relative social freedom women experienced on the frontier, at least the general lack of social restraint, afforded women some unprecedented economic opportunities in the mid to late 1800s. Women entrepreneurs like Mary Ellen Pleasant and Biddy Mason amassed fortunes in the millions. Pleasant's fortune was assessed at upwards of $30 million. That's 1860s money. So the lawlessness and gunslinging of the West presented both danger and opportunity for blacks on the frontier. That's the nature and significance of the frontier as it relates to blacks. What would you choose? Would you choose the relative safety of the established urban setting? Or would you choose the high risk, high reward and relative freedom of the frontier? What factors would influence your decision? Let's talk about that in the comments below. You've been watching African Elements, and I'd like to give a huge thanks to my patrons for supporting this work. If you'd like to subscribe for early access and ad-free videos for as little as a dollar a month, hit the link to my Patreon page in the description below. Or if you think we've earned it, be sure to hit that like button and bell notification to be notified when new content drops. I'm Darius Spearin. Thank you for watching.